So hi everyone. Uh, welcome to, to this first uh, webinar on um, explosive ordnance risk education and uh, COVID-19, EORE uh, slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us despite um, the very um, uh, brief, the very short notice. Uh, you had um, just a few hours to to uh, plan this uh, participation, so thanks for your flexibility uh, on that. My name is Hugues Lorange. I work for UNICEF, and I'm also co-chair of the um, EORE advisory group. And um, I will just introduce you the way we will organize this webinar uh, in the, that, that we will handle in the coming hour. So I will start with a brief introduction to set the scene um, for this webinar and then give the floor to Caitlin Hodge. Uh, Caitlin is working with the GICHD and she will handle all the logistics of this um, webinar. So she will brief you about all, all the different features that we'll be able to use for the, um, for the webinar. Then we will move on to um, a few presentations. We have um, um, a very interesting panel of uh, colleagues from the UN side, from um, the NGO side, both at um, international level and, and local level. Um, and I will introduce them one by one afterwards. So I won't introduce them now. Um, and then after that, we'll have a Q&A uh, up to the end of the, of the webinar. And then we'll wrap up and uh, conclude the, the webinar. Um, so that's the, the way we will organize this, this, um, this um, webinar. Uh, let me first uh, introduce you and set the, and set the scene for, for the coming hour. So why, do, why did we organize, why did we decide to organize this webinar? I think there are uh, two key dimensions that, um, that uh, justify this webinar uh, and that explain why we, why we wanted to organize this. Uh, the first point, the first dimension is that the COVID has uh, tremendous consequences in terms of uh, disrupting our programming, our EORE uh, programming activities. That's one dimension. And the second dimension that we will uh, explore uh, today is um, how our, it's about how our sector uh, can play a role in, in, in terms of the COVID-19 uh, response. We may play, we may have a special role uh, these days and in, in the coming weeks and, and probably months. Um, apparently, uh, in, uh, in light of this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis, um, the most effective way to mitigate the impact of the COVID is, is, to, um, is through behavior change. Uh, and we have, and it's, it is precise, precisely our, um, um, Speciality, uh, our expertise, behavior change uh, is an outcome for, for EORE. But of course, it's not easy uh, as many other sectors, uh, whether it is HIV, uh, wash, water and sanitation, um, road safety, um, child marriage, prevention of child marriage, etc. Uh, the first instinct, the first uh, approach that we, the preferred approach that we have is to use a face-to-face -face approach for behavior change. But this won't work um, these days as we have uh, limitations uh, due, due precisely due to the COVID. So we need to be creative. So the goal, um, the goal of this um, discussion of this um, webinar will be to take stock uh, of the impact of the COVID on uh, our programs, uh, on our EORE programs, and to discuss how we can adapt um, our EORE sector, either to maintain uh, our activities uh, or to support uh, COVID 
risk education uh, efforts, or even to combine both EORE and uh, COVID-19 risk education efforts. So that will be the key objective of this, uh, of this um, uh, webinar. A longer term um, objective uh, or medium term objective, it would be to develop some guidance, some global guidance, and that will be the responsibility of the um, advisory group, uh, the EORE advisory group, with your support, with your inputs, with your help. Um, I'm talking about the broader EORE community. We still, need, we still need to discuss with the members of the EORE, EORE advisory group how, um, to which extent we want to go on, on that. But the idea is to develop some kind of guidance that would be beneficial for, for the entire sector. So that's for the, um, the longer term. Uh, let me emphasize as well some, um, some ground principles for this webinar. Uh, the, first, the first thing is that um, I should clarify that we won't discuss, um, we will discuss EORE in relation to COVID, but we won't have a, a general COVID-19 uh, discussion. We are not uh, ourselves COVID-19 specialists, so we won't uh, dive into um, uh, these um, uh, COVID-19 uh, messaging. That's not the purpose. It's really about EORE in light of, of the COVID response. Uh, this will be a brainstorming, so feel free to participate and you will see, you, you will see, you will see that as part of the Zoom uh, functionalities, you have a Q&A box, uh, sorry, a Q&A um, uh, feature and a chat feature. So I will encourage you, uh, starting from now, to use this uh, Q and A um, function and this chat function. Caitlin will will explain more about that. But you can already start. Um, as well, there is a, um, a poll that we. I mean, we have one question and it's on the screen, and this is primarily primarily for the field. So we enc encourage you to to participate in this. Poll. Uh, it's a first experience. It's a first um, webinar. We think there will be more webinars in the coming uh, uh, weeks. So this is the first one. It's also a test, and we'll try to improve that um, uh, as it goes. It will be also recorded. I received a number of messages from colleagues, from partners, like from Vietnam or Myanmar. Uh, it's already too late there, so we, they won't be able to join, but we'll have a recorded version that we'll share afterwards. Uh, and one more point on the Q&A. Um, please uh, send us your question, your points, uh, as well in the chat box. And even though we cannot address all those questions and points, uh, we'll make sure we have a package that we share with, with all of you um, in the um, in the coming uh, day uh, with the support of, of Caitlin. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to, to uh, Caitlin so you explain us in more details the logistics of the webinar. Go ahead, Kate, Caitlin, thanks. Thanks, Ook. Give me just a second and I will uh, get a slide up here for you. Uh, so as Ook explained, this session is being recorded. Um, that includes both the visuals um, and what is said in the chat box. We uh, have also automatically muted your microphones, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't engage. Um, it's just a practicality purpose for a group this big. So the two ways that Uke mentioned that you can engage are through the Q&A feature and the chats. So Q&A, meaning questions and answers, um, there's an icon at the bottom of your screen, and that's where you can use to share questions with us. Um, the panelists will try to monitor this and when possible to answer the questions that could be through written answers or verbally in their presentations. As Uke said, we won't have time to get to all of the questions um, and we likely won't have all of the answers yet. This is just the beginning. 
but of course the questions will inform um, future guidance and future webinars and um, so please ask away you can share your questions at any time you have the option to share them anonymously and just so you know everyone will see the questions that you share um, of course anonymously if if desired the other option you have is the chat box icon also at the bottom of your screen you can use this to share messages um, for example if you want to introduce yourself, we encourage you to update us on how your organization is responding. And also you can use this to tell us if you're having technological challenges, if you can't hear, if it's going too fast. I will be monitoring this chat, um, especially to hear of the tech challenges, um, but likely the panelists won't be able to read it until after the webinar. So just keep that in mind. The questions is the best way to get a question highlighted quickly. If you select in that chat box to send your message to all panelists and attendees, which we encourage you to do, um, everyone will see what you post here and it will appear in the recording as well. Um, that's all on the logistics. And so with that, I'll uh, hand it back to Ug. Many thanks, Caitlin, um, uh, based in Geneva. Uh, from uh, for this crystal clear introduction and um, as Caitlin mentioned um, you can even uh, send uh, anonymous uh, comments or questions if you feel uh, slightly um, not confident uh, or you think it's it's a little slightly sensitive so please you can use this feature as well uh, generally, as I said, this is uh, brainstorming. Uh, we are learning, we are in a learning curve, in a, in a learning experience. This is a completely new um, um, situation for all of us. So we need to learn from each other, um, from everyone. Uh, so please don't, don't hesitate to, to raise your points and, and ask questions and raise your concerns as well. Without further ado, we'll start with our panelists, uh, our very distinguished panelists, and we'll start with first uh, the NGO world. Uh, and I would like to give the floor to Sebastian Kazak, who is the co-chair of um, the, the advisory group and as well um, uh, representing MAG. So please, uh, Sebastian, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Hugh. And um, looking forward to, to hear all the questions and, uh, coming from the field. And I see that we really have a large range of countries and uh, common names and friends. So hi to everyone. Um, I will switch now to, to a presentation. Um, I prepared a little PowerPoint and uh, uh, hope you can all see that. Um, wait, how do you go to share? Um, okay. All right. So, yeah, um, we want to take you a bit. What's the situation for Mag, and of course, some considerations then for for all operators. I think we we are struggling with. So let me go right into it. We, as Mag, uh, have been doing risk education in sixteen countries. But as of this morning, we are down to one country uh, still um, implementing in the field and uh, thinking how to start or restart more remote uh, ways using mass media. Um, some countries are actually on a usual break, stand down, extending this period a bit to take a decision later. But um, mostly we are basically shut down by local authority decisions and the guidance coming from the health ministries. And the last one was actually today then Vietnam with a global, um, for the whole country, um, decision to shut down. So in some countries we felt uh, in our own risk analysis, it's wiser to stop operations. And um, so that's the kind of, I guess, all of the organizations um, are situation that they're in. Um, the communication language used by the COVID community is, uh, from WHO and, and, and so on, the, the, the health practitioners, 
is uh, similar but not the same. So I thought that was interesting to see if we think to integrate um, COVID-19 messaging or not. So they call it risk communication and community engagement. We call it uh, risk education and community liaison. So is it easy to integrate or not? Well, at first sight, yes, we have a lot of um, experience with known aspects like okay, it's new, there's a lack of knowledge how to deal with this. At the same time, there's a lot of misinformation, uh, myths going around, uh, creating, um, yeah, all that. Then we have the behaviors that range from acceptance of the mitigation uh, measures um, to outright rejection, this is all nonsense, and um, this is the, the white disease or the whatever. Yeah? So we, we are known to this as well. Uh, we have reckless people um, who just uh, don't want to listen, take risks, um, or they are forced to take risks. So we are well, very well known to this. Forced in the case, in the sense of okay, they still have to go do their job. They prefer to. I mean, yeah, you know, I don't need to go into detail. So this all leads to a change of life patterns due to a new risk. So that's what we have been dealing with for the last 20, 30 years. And the question we could ask ourselves, so does COVID-19 put people at more risk or less risk from explosive ordnance? And probably we'll find different answers. Of course, lockdown will uh, reduce the risk of stepping on explosive ordnance. On the other side, the ones I mentioned, forced and uh, in poverty situations, so having to go out, maybe even venture further uh, than before, may be more at risk. It is a sensitive subject. Um, people don't want to be stigmatized, uh, seen as bringing the disease, being the first one in the village or whatever. Um, for us, we're used to it that it's uh, mine action is a sensitive subject and people have fear retributions. In some countries, it does go that far that there have been also attacks and people have been coughing sick and so on. So there are a lot of similarities. However, the stigma is is an additional dimension I think in this uh, sense we have not we do not need to face in the EORE community uh, we can learn from HIV from Ebola and so on um, stigma is something I think we need to then learn to how to work on it and around it we have experience community level work but the spacing is the big question group meetings how to do that safely in case we can operate um, we need to, if we give messages to, to wash your hands, do people have access to water? Do they have soap? What is the situation in that community? It should be realistic, locally adapted, as we say, for replication on explosive ordinance as well. So um, focus our work on the most vulnerable. I just saw Afghanistan mentioning, yeah, we work on the borders because we think that is the biggest risk. Same I heard basically on uh, for Myanmar, Migrants are all coming back from the Thai side in the tens of thousands and uh, yeah, so, okay. Key considerations, so for MAG, the health and well-being of our staff and the, the families is number one priority. We will guard against any action which might aid the spread of the virus. So are we becoming a vector by going into communities? That is something we need to consider. Um, is it a, a risk or not? Definitely all staff in this sense need to be trained on COVID-19 response. We have to start practicing safe behavior internally, set up our SOPs, uh, work through our existing family and, and further networks, summarize duty of care. The mitigation measures need to be in place, also like uh, driving cars, what is safe distancing, and, and uh, all these things um, are changing our work. Um, we should support more than the options for remote working. Uh, do people have laptops? What's the internet connection at home? Do they have phone credits uh, to actually make the calls, etc.? So we will. This will not stop now with the operations being shut down, but we will start thinking again. Or can when can we restart? What are the right conditions to restart? All these uh, criteria are in the open and also within Mac. We are just discussing it basically as we speak key considerations too. We will continue to deliver operations if it is both safe and permissible to do so. And that's the big question because there are so many unknowns about the COVID-19 and um, how it is really passed on. So 
if we continue face-to-face -face messaging and but also for other uh, works let's see how we can integrate COVID-19 if the organization agrees to so we need to adjust our ways of working and innovate so I think um, we'll have some examples from other partners in, in this call today um, definitely start or enhance the use of mass media digital social media why not think of print media as well, if they um, exist and are still delivered and bought? So the big question is for us, do we cover, incorporate COVID-19, yes or no? To which extent? Um, basically one thing I would say, leave the mass messaging to the pros for two-way messaging on radio, for example. We are, as you said, we are not the health specialists and we cannot properly answer questions if there is a question answer session on radio. Key considerations number three. So we, as MAG, we are engaged in dialogue with our donors. Um, they are, remain hugely supportive and understand the challenges and we'll see how this develops now over the coming months. But this may mean, okay, maybe we need additional different funding to enhance uh, ERE via mass and digital media. Maybe we can reallocate some of the money that we are not spending right now, but of course we do not uh, want to put people out of their jobs and the operational continuity comes first. Uh, key considerations for the threat will lessen, but the threat posed by landmines continues, those of ordnance, et cetera. So, okay, that is, it, it will lessen and people will um, get used to it, but we also know there may be phases of outbreak again. And uh, so I think we, our work will not be the same in the future as it has been in the past. So. Let's stay focused, do what we know how to do best, and let's make sure that we really maintain contact with our staff, do welfare checks, coping mechanisms, um, but uh, COVID-19 will not go away. So we really need to be prepared and that's why we are doing this call. Takeaways, final slide. So first of all, do no harm. Do not become a vector yourself, do not spread the disease. Um, have SOPs in place for the organization of transport, um, spacing in the office, um, if you work from home, what's the support, et cetera. We should not force people to, to work in communities if they don't want to. Um, so it becomes a bit of a volunteerism instead of we're hiring people, but if they are scared, we, I, I think we think we should not force our staff to, if they don't want to. Um, and then there are already communities who do not want to see us. So we have to make sure first, do they actually want any visitors? If so, how do we it safely? And uh, we have to be an example of applying the COVID safety protocols. More practically, so reduce group meetings, do more house to house. Other people say, no, we can't do house to house. That's dangerous. It doesn't mean to go inside the house. You can keep distances, you're in the fresh air. You can, I think, why not? Um, keep groups small, uh, ensure the physical distancing, Wear masks, but masks and talking through a mask is, is not that easy. So let's see what the best uh, protocol then really is and explain why we do this. Um, be an example yourself, uh, set up hand washing, control space, people who can join uh, a meeting and who cannot. And so it has to be much more rigid than we are used to. And again, let's be creative. Let's find alternatives to continue um, to support those most vulnerable and exposed to the explosive ordnance threat. So let's stick to what we know and do best. Thanks. Thank you, um, Sebastian. That's, um, that's a very great uh, presentation. So thanks, it's very informative and, and thanks for sharing all your takeaways. Uh, I have a call for all participants uh, and I would encourage you to also use the Q&A um, box. I, I have seen so far very few questions. So please um, uh, don't hesitate to use this Q&A box um, during this, this uh, discussion. However, the chat box is very intense and um, it's amazing um, to see all this contribution from so many different countries. So thanks all of you too for participating in the, in the, in the chat uh, discussion and for the few who participate in the Q&A. 
So please don't hesitate to continue uh, using the chat box and the Q&A. Um, now I'm pleased to, to introduce you uh, the next speaker. As we all know, local NGOs are in the forefront um, of, of the EORE work. We have actually thousands of, of local NGOs involved in EORE throughout the world. Uh, and we wanted also to, to give them an opportunity. So um, in this, the next panel is um, Ahmed, Mr. Uh, Ahmed Abdul Karim. Uh, I think, I'm not sure it's your exact name, Ahmed, um, but you will confirm. Uh, please, um, Ahmed from uh, IHSCO, and I, I give you a chance to, to um, unpack the acronym IHSCO. Go ahead, Ahmed, you have the floor. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you for everybody attending this uh, webinar, which is uh, really very critical on this time. And I hope everybody uh, stays safe, sound, and, and healthy uh, in the midst of this crisis. Um, and my name is Ahmed, and uh, our NGO is Iraqi Health and Social Care Organization. Uh, which is doing uh, risk education as part of uh, many other activities. Um, I'll try to be very short and succinct in our presentation and um, uh, hopefully that if, if we have uh, any um, questions, etc., then we can, uh, uh, we can answer afterwards. Uh, I'll just uh, share my screen now. Okay, so actually uh, the context in Iraq uh, is probably is similar to many other contexts uh, in the region and different uh, uh, countries in the world. So uh, it is hit actually by the curfews that are um, you know, imposed by the uh, federal and local governments on the, uh, on the different uh, provinces and governorates um, in Iraq. Uh, even though some of these uh, governorates are, were not hit by the uh, COVID uh, crisis uh, as a preventive uh, or precaution uh, measure. So uh, these uh, curfews impacted actually the, the movement and accessibility to certain areas of operations according to the original plans in risk education. And uh, we had to adapt to the situation and to try to work with the possible uh, movement uh, available and to try to lobby the government to give exemptions or um, access letters uh, to support the movement of risk education teams while they do both uh, risk education and COVID, brief COVID uh, messaging to the communities. And that uh, inaccessibility or it will it it created a lot of logistic and uh, uh, financial uh, obstacles and challenges in terms of mobilization of resources um, of uh, different types of payment supplies of uh, of materials um, and even the cash flow with the payment of salaries of people um, in working in different places uh, uh, and then the um, uh, the health concerns of spreading the virus actually, uh, the risks that are posed on the uh, on the teams themselves, uh, because the, you know they are dealing with tens and hundreds of people, and then uh, the fear for spreading the virus themselves if they operate in a certain area that is contaminated and they don't know while they move from one area to another. So that's that was a real concern. Uh, for the uh, health and safety of staff and the beneficiaries. The, um, the KFU is also impacted on the shutdown of the government departments and the communications with the uh, different local and federal authorities uh, in order to get uh, different services, even with, um, for example, the uh, 
um, communications with the Mine Action Authority, uh, with the Minister of Health, for example, with the uh, governor offices in different areas, um, uh, getting some information or exchange of information, etc. Um, even on the private sector, if, if you have the supplies of different materials, uh, printing materials, uh, sending uh, RE SMS uh, through the telecommunication companies, always really hit by the uh, shutdown of the KFU uh, that started um, uh, around a month ago. So what did we have to do in order to adapt to the situation? We started with, um, after consultations with uh, some of our donors and partners actually, we had to um, do door-to-door -door sessions um, considering uh, that we uh, follow some of the uh, instructions, uh, health instructions, let's say, distance between beneficiaries and team, uh, among the beneficiaries themselves, um, the number of group to provide uh, risk education to, um, combination of the RE messages with the COVID messages, basic messages um, that, that we got from WHO uh, and um, uh, from uh, training by um, our medics working on other programs. Um, liaison with the Department of Health in order to get uh, some of the up-to-date messages uh, in terms of COVID for safety of our staff and people. So, uh, and that is associated actually with the distribution of what we called RE COVID hygiene kits. These hygiene kits uh, composed of uh, soap, as you can see in these uh, photos, um, hand soap, uh, uh, different, different hygiene materials that are distributed with RE stickers on, uh, on, each, on each kit. And these are provided to people while teams move around and give uh, RE COVID uh, short or safety briefing messages or emergency messages. And uh, uh, we were also taking uh, into consideration the escalation of the, um, uh, of the issue and the uh, strict uh, curfew and movement um, uh, restrictions that we can get from the government. And as we expected actually, uh, today, DMA uh, asked uh, RE operators or mine action operators actually to stand down in the field. So even before that, we were very much prepared and we started actually working on other methods. Um, we, we focused on uh, different media um, channels. Um, so one of them is the um, mass media that we had uh, an agreement with the Iraqi Educational Satellite Channel. Uh, and you can imagine now that all uh, pupils and students are at home, uh, studying from home, and they should watch that educational channel. And, and ISCO have uh, four uh, RETV spots, and we have the agreement with the educational channel you know, to broadcast these short uh, four to five minute spots, each one. To, uh, to show it on the satellite channel uh, so that it has more exposure to people. Um, small media with the distribution of the available printed materials, um, apart from the stickers, the leaflets, the uh, posters, etc. Uh, we also, uh, in, um, in other projects uh, supported by NMAS, actually we installed uh, big screens in IDP camps, uh, which are under the health center and the camp management uh, direction and maintenance and, and, and protection. Uh, they show uh, RE materials, the TV spots that we have, some key messages, plus uh, some health messages um, that are provided by the camps, by different NGOs operating in the camps, and by the Minister of Health. And now, uh, we are trying to get COVID messages incorporated in the same, uh, let's say, uh, screen program that we have for people inside IDP camps. And on social media, actually, we tried to many, many channels, actually, to spread 
we created, for example, a YouTube channel, uh, Telegram account, um, linking all these to, to Facebook, uh, spreading uh, the messages, COVID and RE messages on Facebook, on, on Facebook page, um, ISCO Facebook page. Uh, and we are still in the process of exploring different um, methods, actually, to go uh, to, in order to reach as much people as we can through the social media. We also had road shows, what we call, which is um, we had different techniques um, um, in Iraq, like in many other different countries in the region and worldwide. Gas, uh, cooking gas is not by pipes uh, to, uh, to each uh, house. It is a distribution of uh, gas cylinders uh, by certain trucks. Uh, but two weeks ago, actually, we, uh, uh, we agreed with some of these suppliers to use uh, our billboards to be fixed on them. And these are not affected actually by the curfews. So once they are moving around, everybody can see it. Um, they receive a presentation and, and a kind of a short training on risk education. And they, they are urged to try to spread the message. Uh, they are also uh, advised on COVID safety um, because, you know, they are dealing with many people, so they need to be very cautious about the situation. The other thing is that um, uh, under a, um, another uh, ANMA supported uh, project, uh, we did uh, what we called a, a kind of a RA delivery scooter, which is a scooter that is driven by a volunteer. And this volunteer, uh, by the way, it's electric, so... Um, it's uh, environment friendly. Um, they, he, uh, well, each uh, scooter has a, a small box with RE materials on it, and the, the volunteer is trained on, on uh, providing RE and COVID. And he has a loudspeaker, uh, which, uh, which contains RE message, short RE messages, and we included, we just in, in, uh, incorporated uh, short COVID messages also to this uh, loudspeaker. Uh, program. So they move around and talk to people. And this is one of the key things, actually, that uh, from previous projects, uh, it's, it's key to um, mobilize uh, community resources available. And uh, I think during development and even emergency uh, projects, uh, we need to consider involvement uh, and capacity building of, of local community members um, in, in risk education and community liaison for such um, crises or for any other type of emergency work and even for development. Um, we have some lessons learned actually from this process that we'd like to share, although it is very short that we've had almost a month. Uh, so, uh, but uh, we think that it's, it's good to share with the other uh, uh, actors. Uh, before doing uh, such activities with the people. We need to get our staff uh, trained professionally on COVID or any type of um, um, endemic or pandemic or, or whatever issues that we have in order to ensure their safety and uh, ensure not to spread the virus uh, uh, among the community members. The other thing is that uh, it's really hard to measure uh, the impact of these different uh, emergency methods, considering the time scale that is available and the um, uh, the context with the movement, uh, it's it's not free to move uh, very frequently, and it is really hard to capture some data. And it is a very short time that we are uh, maneuvering. Uh, as I said, community networks are really important. In previously supported and my supported projects, we had to uh, program uh, what we call community-based uh, risk education volunteers who were adults from both genders in order to uh, reach as, as much people as we can. Uh, and the other one is the risk education youth ambassadors. And um, they worked perfectly during the project. And now we have realized uh, during emergency that they are good resources to mobilize uh, to support our activities within their communities. Um, our activities can be utilized for other humanitarian uh, response purposes, and COVID is one of them, and I think uh, 
um, other experiences in the world and with other crises, I think it's it's uh, crucial. And I think some experiences, some successful experiences, have proved uh, about that. And I think it's something that we need to consider for the future, uh, for with the integration uh, of RE within um, other humanitarian responses, innovation with a new any kind of new methods uh, that are context specific are really key to emergency and we need to get to keep all this in mind actually um, uh, mine action or re actors should al uh, always keep in mind putting such um, contingency plans on for in, in terms of their risk management uh, for similar things to happen in the future and I think it, it is a good lesson learned uh, from uh, different perspectives. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ahmed, uh, for this um, comprehensive overview of, of your work in, in um, many parts of Iraq. That was extremely informative. I apologize for not, not using the, the right name earlier. Uh, so your right name is, is Ahmed Al-Zubaidi. Um, I left your business card in, in my office and that's why I, I completely uh, forgot your, your name and just saw it in the screen. So thanks Ahmed, this is a great uh, presentation. And thanks everyone for, for uh, participating in the Q&A and, and, and the chat. So if you have any question to any uh, given um, panelist, please raise them through the, the Q&A or if you prefer through, through the chat box. I would like to now give the floor to uh, UN colleagues and I will start with um, Unmas. So Paul uh, Eslop is uh, leading uh, UNMAS programs globally. And Paul, you have the floor uh, for this um, EORE COVID uh, response. Thank you, Paul. Thank, thanks, Luz. Um, uh, well, I'm glad to be going after Sebastian because Sebastian covered um, nearly all of the issues that we've got so um that will allow me to be much shorter um i i think i think he summarized um most of the issues really well i mean we two weeks ago two and a half weeks ago we started to look at incorporating um covid materials into our risk education packages being um given around the world um and but very quickly we we got overtaken by a lot of the issues he raised in terms of so, social distancing, social separation, uh, not bringing large groups of people together, um, and having the right materials. Um, our guideline with regard, or the direction from headquarters to the field with regard to guidelines, is very much to use um, uh, WHO um, material where possible, and certainly stick to the the messaging and the guidance that has come out from. WHO and, and UNICEF to a degree um, and we're also looking at how we can incorporate materials either um, as part of explosive ordnance risk education or actually just completely swapping it out and, and using slots on on radios or, or or the different media that we have access to um, just to do um, COVID education. Um, but the situation is changing so quickly on, on a daily basis across the programs that it's 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 now virtually impossible for us to maintain any sort of tempo with regard to this issue. And we're we're gonna have a, a call with our program managers today and, and see how we can how we can adjust and whether it's even gonna be possible to continue to do risk education um, across the world in terms of um, People might also be interested in terms of clearance operations. We we have very little left now. A, a week ago, we had nearly every program working. Now, as of today, really, um, the only programs that have significant operations going on is is Afghanistan, Somalia, um, South Sudan, a little bit in Abia. Um, Darfur is looking though is going to go down on lockdown today, so that will stop. And Mali, 
So really, it's the, the three our three big peacekeeping missions. We're still able to provide support to, to those and some work in Afghanistan, but the re the rest of the world is is rapidly moving towards lockdown. Either with staff trapped out of the country, um, staff, airports closed so we can't do Kazakh, or um, or Sim simply um, there are, are checkpoints and there's no movements going on and, and, and people can't, can't get around. Um, obviously this has been um, reviewed on a daily basis, but in, in reality it looks like most of our operations are going to be um, very, very significantly con curtailed, um, I would say for the next month, six weeks at least. Um, we are reaching out to donors and seeing um, what their policies on that um, a couple of donors have been quite positive so far in in saying that they are prepared to um, continue covering salaries for staff who who are unable to work due to COVID, which will be um, very significant. I mean, we're obviously very concerned about um, you know a lot of the D miners are already in very poor countries, and the loss of income will have have significant impact on on them and their communities. So so we're going to try and see what we can do to. To, to, to mitigate that. Um, in terms of peacekeeping and, and the UN, we're, we're starting to see um, potential of, of exhibiting uh, anti-UN um, fears in that the perception is the UN has either brought the, the virus to the country or they're spreading it. So we're, we're, we're trying very much to um, ensure our profile is as low as possible and that we're seen to be supporting the national authorities and the government uh, and to this end, um, some of our peacekeeping budget uh, money is being reprogrammed um, to go purely into COVID response uh, and not my action, um, which I think is a longer term trend will probably indicate that there will be less funding over the next year coming through unmasked for my action, um, which is obviously a concern, but very understandable in the situation. Um, in terms of... Um, Next steps, um, we're, we're very much looking at our, our resilience plans and, and business continuity. But again, with, with the situation changing a, a, as quickly as it is on a daily basis, um, it's almost every plan we, we make um, gets torn, torn up two days later. I'm sure um, most people on the call are in, in, in a similar situation. Um, but that's, um, that's a very quick overview. And um, I'd very much... Um, uh, support everything that um, Sebastian said, and um, and say to um, you know, and and say if there's anything we can do to help, uh, let us know, and um, we'll see what we can do. Um, back to you, Sebastian. Uh, sorry, back to you, back to you, Uj. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Paul, for um, giving some of your time for for these uh, for our EORE community. Uh, UNMAS is, is increasingly, has been increasingly engaged in EORE over the last uh, years. Uh, so we, it's great you have, we have your perspective. Uh, thanks, Paul. And we'll make sure if there is any specific question to, to you, we'll make sure we, we share you, them with you. Um, so thanks a lot for this, this UNMAS uh, overview and, and sharing all your concerns and, and actually as well, um, the way you are handling this, uh, the way you started to hand, handling, handle this uh, over the last days, that's uh, inspiring uh, as well. You also mentioned uh, the importance of, of reaching out to donors and we actually invited some donors, but I would say only a few donors. We didn't manage to invite uh, the Mine Action Support Group, which is the the most important group of donors for Mine Action. But um, I think we should share this webinar with them. Uh, it's recorded, so after, afterwards we should make sure uh, we share the link of this webinar with the donors. And you can do that from your end at uh, national level, at regional level, and we'll do that at, at global level. Um, the next speaker on my list is um, actually from Yemen. Uh, we have uh, Abraham Achik, 
with overseeing the children and armed conflict agenda in Yemen. Um, Abraham, can you share the screen? Uh, can you share your, the video and the screen with us? You have the floor, Abraham. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Hawk and uh, colleagues. Uh, this is uh, a very quick uh, participation from Yemen. We did not basically prepare a lot of uh, presentation. Uh, we feel that we should be part of the, the discussion. And what I will do here is not what we are currently doing, but I want to share with you the, the, the situation of uh, mine reseducation or the EOR in Yemen and uh, the way the COVID-19 is going to be impacting uh, our uh, interventions. Basically, Yemen is still uh, one of the countries that has not reported any case as so far, but uh, the situation is actually checking uh, the whole country. So what, what is happening in Yemen, despite the fact that the COVID-19 is uh, shaking the well, the call for, uh, for uh, unilateral ceasefire is not taking shape in Yemen. We are still seeing a lot of fighting uh, going on in the country. We basically have more than 35 fronts which are active with daily air strike and, uh, and a lot of fighting in different fronts. So far we have about 20 governorates out of 21 where uh, mines and UXOs uh, continue to, uh, to impact on the civilian. We have over 3, 000, 3 million uh, people out of which 2 million are children that are at risk of injuries and death due to mines and UXOs and ERW in the context of Yemen. Uh, as we speak, the current challenge that we have, we deliver the we deliver the, the, the minority education uh, in the schools, but as we speak now, the schools have been closed. The schools have been closed down. Uh, I will take this time to bore you a little bit with some of the statistics that we have. Uh, the highest, the mine and the ERWs are considered as one of the third highest cause of child casualties in Yemen. Uh, the, 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 the recent country specific report that was released for, uh, by the UN indicate mines and, 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 uh, explos and an explosive ordinance of war were the third leading cause of the child death. In 2019 alone, we have over 700, over, over 374 uh, children that were maimed and killed because of the, the mines. And in the last five years, we have more than uh, 700 children that have been injured and maimed because of mines and uh, other remnants of war. Now the schools have been closed uh, because of the COVID-19. We are unable to, uh, to continue to deliver the Myers education messages in the schools. The, the EOR activities at the community level have also been suspended. Uh, we were hoping that the Universal Day of Mine Action was going to be an opportunity for some of the activities uh, that were going to be coordinated between the Ministry of Education and, uh, and, uh, and Yemen Mine Authority, but this has also been canceled. Uh, the ongoing, especially a lot of fighting in El Juof and Marib is, uh, is a serious risk that we are anticipating uh, because population is continuing to, to be displaced. Uh, what we are proposing currently uh, because of the COVID-19 and the closure of the schools and uh, restriction of movement, we are looking at uh, using the digital uh, platform uh, and do this work remotely with the communities, especially uh, doing also training of the facilitators using the, the Zoom link the Skype and uh, uh, disseminating most of these uh, messages using the WhatsApp and uh, some of other digital apps that are available in, in the country. Uh, we are also trying to be very careful not to cause a lot of risk, especially to the monitors and the community people, uh, because there is a, a, a restriction in movement across the country and we do not want to bring people together in, in this context. We are also trying to work together with the mine risk authorities to, 
to have some kind of a flight information uh, to be delivered in the in the in different platforms so what we are trying to do here is to be part of the global uh, initiative to see how best we can be able to reach these communities that are impacted by by the the conflict in yemen so we we do not want to suspend any activity but the situation is uh, is very fluid in the context of yemen so we will continue to borrow best practices from other countries uh, that are currently uh, implementing so that we can continue to see uh, how uh, we can uh, continue to intervene. There is a serious fear in Yemen because the health facilities are completely uh, uh, destroyed. So if the, if the infection reach Yemen, it will be a disaster because there will be very limited intervention by health authorities. And uh, the impact will be very difficult. It will be uh, serious on, on the communities. There are also a serious risk that are existing because uh, uh, there are people that have been deported from the KSA into Yemen. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are anticipating that this can uh, cause contamination. So until now, the capacity to do testing is also a challenge in Yemen. So we cannot rule out the presence of uh, the infection, uh, but it has not yet been reported. So we are basically worried. There's no movement in the, in the, in the whole country. Uh, so we are continuing uh, watching what is happening and we will continue to be part of the, the webinars that are happening so that we can take uh, best practices that are happening in other countries. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Abraham, for this um, overview on the, on the situation in Yemen, um, and um, and and for uh, your interest as well on on this uh, webinar. As we said, this is the first one. There will be other ones, uh, and we'll make sure we'll we'll uh, be able to provide some guidance. Um, we don't know which shape it will take, but we'll make sure we, we will provide this guidance. Um, I will just uh, ask a quick question to you, uh, Abraham, um, perhaps because I, I didn't listen properly the first, um, your first, uh, what you said in the first minute. Um, I heard that there is a curfew, an ongoing curfew that was agreed in uh, Yemen, but you, you mentioned that airstrikes are ongoing, that the conflict is ongoing. Did I, underst did I understand well? Yeah, there's a curfew which is uh, imposed, but uh, despite this curfew, it has not stopped the fighting. The fighting is still going on in several uh, fronts, and a lot of air airstrikes are also happening across the country. Thank you, uh, Abraham, for this uh, for this clarification. Um, and please stay with us for the for the rest of the of the webinar. Um, I just want to make a, a, a quick point here uh, about the logistics. We, we have a, a, a poll uh, that is ongoing and we'll end this poll by the end of this webinar. So for those, who want, for those from the field who want to participate in the poll, do not hesitate to click on it. Um, we had planned to invite, uh, we actually invited ICRC uh, but as you know, um, we, we had a very short notice for actually for all of us, uh, including for speakers. And I think for this webinar, we might not be able to have uh, an ICRC speaker this time. Uh, but I know that um, the team is very uh, committed and, and this will uh, be organized for a, a next webinar. Unless um, Lou, Mareska, or whoever from IC would like to jump in. Um, um, we won't have this time a, a, an ICSC speaker. However, um, I would like to move to the next speaker uh, and the last speaker, unless we have uh, someone from ICSC. It would be Sylvie uh, Bucco. So Sylvie Bucco from uh, GICHD, uh, you have the floor and uh, please go ahead. Thanks, Sylvie.
Yes, thank you, Hugh. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you please confirm? I'm... We can hear you very well, crystal clear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting uh, the JSCHD uh, to actually participate in this very interesting webinar. I hope you are all uh, safe so far and that will continue. Um, so actually, uh, you know, the GICHD uh, is currently leading a review of new technologies and methodologies for EORE in challenging contexts. Uh, three main challenges uh, have been uh, looked at, uh, which are EORE for IEDs, EORE in situation of urban contamination, and the most interesting for us as of today is the EORE for areas with limited to no accessibility. So within this uh, specific context of COVID-19, uh, the use of remote technologies and methodology are of great importance to ensure uh, that EORE practitioners and beneficiaries don't put uh, themselves at risk and that prevention messages can reach people uh, which are at risk as well as communities. So we have tried to prepare for this uh, webinar actually a short document um, which aims at sharing some of the preliminary findings of the review, in particular with regards uh, with technologies used uh, to reach areas with limited to no accessibility, as I've said. So I have prepared the table uh, which uh, tries to provide an overview of the new technologies used by the sector to facilitate the remote delivery of EORE and that can of outline some of the good practices um, and lessons learned that has been shared so far. Please just know that the analysis uh, is still going on. Um, that also uh, we've not included for our today's discussion mobile data collection uh, tools that have been reported. Um, and so let me share my screen. Oh. Right, can you see properly? We can see uh, your screen. Um, okay. uh, very good, thanks. All right, thank you for this confirmation. So the way I've, um, we have actually prepared this table, you can see in the left column uh, the technologies and then good practices and key lessons learned. So I will, uh, I can share this document with, uh, we can share this document with all of you uh, after the webinar and I won't read all of it uh, now. So we leave some questions and answers, uh, some time for questions and answers. Just know that, uh, I can be also contacted. You have my email here uh, for further details on some specific te technologies, um, because again, this is just uh, an abstract that you can see on your screen now. So um, social media campaigns uh, using uh, either one of uh, the, the um, uh, social media tools like WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or also maybe sometimes uh, some of you have been using all of them at the same time. So in terms of good practices, uh, it's obviously a mass communication tool. Uh, it uh, has a low cost and it can also play the role of advertisement by posting EORE activities, uh, agenda, or messages. Um, WhatsApp, uh, it offers big monitoring benefits considering the speed and the widespread usage. Uh, it's obviously also a good way to send and receive information uh, along with the location services. The application allows you to manage and share targeted information and media. Um, it can also be used to report incidents and accidents uh, and allow a quick and coordinated response whenever this is appropriate uh, and possible today. It's cost efficient, it facilitates permanent communication, and you can also use it um, to actually disseminate IVR pre-recorded messages. Um, when we look also at specific uh, Facebook advertisement, uh, you have a rapid dissemination of updated uh, errory messages, which can be based on new accident trends or explosive hazards and target actually very specific areas or at risk uh, people. Uh, it's low cost, it has an extensive reach, and it's also easily uh, scalable. 
Uh, one very interesting, uh, I thought, lessons learned uh, that could be shared also with you uh, today is like um, we've been told that turning off the common section and including contact information for national mine action authorities can actually help or force even the users to bring their concern to national authorities rather than just comment about them and in turn uh, create a requirement for personnel to monitor on comments. Um, another tool that has been also reported is Facebook videos. So uh, using uh, the behavior change communication uh, approach, um, which um, can be also very interesting, especially now, uh, looking at the prevention messages in relation with the COVID-19. Um, it can complement also the dissemination of uh, the videos with uh, this disseminated uh, on Facebook, but also on television, since uh, some of you are considering mass media. Um, and also note that a baseline survey can also be done on the phone, uh, since we are most of us working uh, from home now, being confined. Um, as it has been also mentioned uh, by Ahmed, uh, for example, today we also have the option of a Facebook page and also a website uh, that allows uh, to establish and maintain good contacts with community focal points, uh, people, uh, community wardens as well. Uh, you can ensure ongoing refreshment trainings and the sharing of new information and instructions. Uh, you can also use that to actually target returnees and IDPs with instant messages related to AORE. Um, and obviously, this can also uh, keep uh, a presence, uh, a digital presence, while reducing uh, the physical uh, presence uh, in the communities. Uh, we also have comprehensive digital advertising campaigns uh, that have been used, uh, for example, in Ukraine. Uh, so the campaign was based and is based on superheroes uh, having uh, different role models, um, videos, website for adults and also another uh, website for kids uh, has been put online. Cooperation with popular YouTube bloggers uh, as well have uh, attracted a lot of attention and millions of, um, of um, uh, views. Uh, screening of uh, comic cartoons uh, can also be considered um, on websites and it has an extensive reach. Digital apps that also have been mentioned um, that, are, that are scalable, low cost, uh, and a good uh, practice is actually uh, to use a backend uh, system that captures users' performances and can allow you to adjust the focus of the program. Um, a specific attention here maybe with digital apps, uh, it's also that from a, uh, a social behavior uh, perspective, the use of different tools to transmit EOR messages can reinforce uh, the messages being transmitted. Um, and I will end also with the risk education talking device. Uh, the good uh, practice is it's that it's environmental friendly, uh, it has, uh, it's solar powered, it fosters social cohesion, it can be recording for multiple dialects, it's also user friendly and entertaining. Uh, it's sustainable because uh, people can actually uh, repeat, uh, listen uh, on different occasions whenever they want, they want to. Uh, it can be easily shared and it remains in the community. It's also interchangeable, which is of, part of particular interest uh, today for us with the COVID because it can be used also for other awareness needs. Um, and it's also uh, uh, inclusive in terms of accessibility for uh, when we consider gender, age, literacy, uh, and also uh, most of the disabilities. Um, yeah. And as uh, someone uh, I've said also in the um, uh, risk education working group, uh, what is also very interesting here with the risk education talking device methodology and tool is that encrypted messages are able to be sent actually to users through SD microcards and where actually messages can be uh, easily uploaded um, and shared uh, and delivered to users in a cost-effective manner uh, rapidly. 
other uh, reported technologies that still need additional details and research, but that we wanted also to share with you uh, today is the, there is a WHO initiative. Um, it's a WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp sorry, helpline, uh, which is a very interesting tool uh, to, uh, to consider, and that would be absolutely great, I believe, my personal opinion, uh, if we could actually come up with a, such uh, an upline um, tool for our sector. Uh, you can find uh, the, the link of an article that uh, ex explains further. Um, you also have so uh, AVR pre-recorded voice messages that can be sent by SMS or WhatsApp. You have the TikTok methodology, uh, which is uh, short for short mobile videos, and you also have signposts uh, targeting specifically people on the move, uh, like returnees and refugees. And that's it for now for me. Uh, Thank you so much, um, Sylvie, for, for sharing your, your findings. And this is act actually the first time we see the, the outcome of your work um, in which you, are, you have been engaged over the last months. So thanks. As Sylvie said, we'll be able, uh, GICG will be able to share with all of us uh, these uh, slides uh, uh, on this overview of, of methodologies and uh, digital approaches that can be used or technologies that can be used for risk education, uh, EORE and possibly uh, EORE and uh, COVID-19. So thanks also, thanks a lot, um, dear um, Sylvie. Um, I think we are now reaching the end, but before that, before we wrap up, um, I would like to give the floor uh, to Lou uh, Lou Maresca from ICRC, just to have a, a few of your um, insights. Um, Lou, if you can take the floor, that would be great. You would be the, the last speaker. Thanks. And then, and then I will wrap up. Thanks. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, thanks for giving me a moment. Uh, it's not often I get the last word, but uh, I'm always happy when I do. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, no, it was a bit short notice, but uh, I thought maybe I'd, I'd give you uh, at least a few words as to how the ICRC is kind of orienting itself uh, in the current environment um, in relation to its risk awareness and safer behavior activities. Um, I think most of what has been said so far touches upon the concerns that we have, both in terms of uh, our duty of care uh, to our own staff and also in particular to the, the National Society partners uh, with whom we work with very closely. Um, and also the, the concerns we have about, uh, of course, uh, affected populations um, and the potential increase to their vulnerabilities um, when they're you know, in or, or nearby weapon contaminated uh, context. Um, I think like others, our, our way of working in, in this field, uh, of course, has had to or is having to adapt and, and to change. Um, and we're taking a, a variety of steps to, to, to do so, uh, to adapt to those circumstances. Uh, I think many of the, the actions taken by others are, are also being taken by us um, with regard to uh, reducing the face-to-face -face meetings, um, moving more towards electronic means of communication, whether that be Facebook, or WhatsApp, Viber, um, maybe going back to SMS and, and videos and national and, and regional radio programs. Um, maybe now we have to add Zoom to the list of potential platforms. And uh, if my children are correct, we should add House Party to the list of potential platforms. I'm not sure I understand how that works. Um, so some of this is being used not only to kind of broadcast widely, but also we're trying to use it in, a, in a bit more of a targeted way in smaller groupings, um, even setting up uh, groups uh, along with the directorate of particular schools um, so that within these areas uh, we get more, we could pass more, more targeted messages. Um, 
you know, our aim is, is, is certainly to, as much as possible and to the extent possible, keep the programs we have ongoing, perhaps in a different way, and maybe enhancing our efforts in, uh, in the electronic media track for, for the time being. Um, so in essence, I think uh, we're not necessarily doing anything groundbreaking or outside the box or even different than others. Um, we're all, I think, using the same kind of tools that we have available uh, in this, this evolving context uh, and trying to use them to the extent possible to keep our, our activities going. Um, so that's kind of a short summary from, from, from where we're coming from. But thanks uh, for giving me a moment to, or two to uh, highlight all that. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Lou, for um, uh, this uh, ICRC perspective. Um, whenever we, we have your insights, uh, it's, it's important um, uh, as well as relating to you, the work of the Red Crescent Society, the Red Cross Society uh, all over the world. Uh, you are a key um, EORE uh, actor. So thanks for, for this, Lou. Uh, we had planned as well to have um, a short, a brief presentation from um, Ukraine. Um, on, um, I mean, a brief update from Ukraine, but we won't have time um, for this webinar. So I, I suggest we postpone that until the next webinar, where we would have um, news uh, and uh, this update from Ukraine. So I hope um, colleagues, uh, C4D, uh, Communication for Development Co communication for development colleagues in Ukraine will, will forgive me uh, that we, we won't be able to, to um, expand this webinar this time, but again, uh, we'll do that for the next one. Um, thanks all of you for, for your participation in the Q&A and the chat. I won't be able to summarize all the points that have been um, raised, uh, but just quick, uh, a, a quick few highlights um, from, um, from the challenges side, from the constraint we have. Um, Mag, through uh, the voice of, of Sebastian Kazak, uh, raised the issue of uh, do no harm, the, the principle of do no harm that we have to keep in mind. It's a sensitive topic, uh, the COVID-19. Uh, it has sensitivities that we we don't necessarily face in in mine action, uh, such as stigmatizing um, some uh, members of the communities. Also, uh, Sebastian highlighted that if we have a two-way communication with um, communities, we have to be very cautious uh, when it comes to COVID because we are ourselves not a health specialist. So um, if we have a two-way communication, let's uh, make sure uh, basically we are not engaged in, in COVID messaging because we won't be able to respond to all the questions raised by the, by the communities. Perhaps on the positive side, a one-way communication can, can be used. As uh, Paul Eslop highlighted, we can uh, use WHO guidance. Uh, for this, there is also a UNICEF gui a global guidance on, on how to address uh, COVID messaging. So as a one-way communication tool that can be used. Ahmed uh, also highlighted all the constraints that uh, didn't come across my mind and, until this webinar. Of course, the COVID as a crisis has an impact on all sectors. So even when you want to mobilize uh, radios, even uh, medias, any media, even if you want to print material these days, it's quite difficult because uh, the whole world is, is uh, slowing down uh, and it's challenging to, to even print new material uh, or to mobilize radio. So that, that's a type of, of hindrance um, and constraints were well highlighted by um, Ahmed. Um, Al, Al Zubaidi. He also, uh, Ahmed, highlighted that there are opportunities to use, for example, loudspeakers um, to display risk education messages and still keep uh, the, the distancing 
So that was uh, an example of activities, but there were many others like using screens, large screens in IDP cans, using Facebook, etc. Um, I saw as, as well in the chat box, uh, there was an interesting comment that if uh, there's restriction in movement, that means less exposure on um, EO, on EO, explosive ordnance. That's a very good point. Uh, the less we have movement, the less we have exposure, and the less we have accidents. So that was observed by ACO from um, uh, ICMA. Uh, thanks, ACO, for this point. But as well, other colleagues like uh, Robin McCarthy from um, ICSC mentioned that we still see movement uh, among. Uh, uh, in location among uh, vulnerable communities. So we still have to be very cautious about that. As always in any crisis, the most vulnerable are still at risk. Where even if there are constraints, even if we have curfews, the most vulner vulnerable remain the same. It's just that the COVID is, is exas exacerbating this vulnerability. So perhaps our work in our um, uh, field is to make sure we, we still um, prioritize the, the most vulnerable uh, people uh, while we deal with these two threats, uh, the EO threat and the um, COVID threat. Um, and then uh, there were a few more points on, the, um, on uh, opportunities to work more with the Ministry of Health. That was highlighted by many of you, especially Ahmed uh, from the Iraq perspective. Um, Paul as, as well mentioned that we have, um, we have a, a, a situation that is changing on a daily basis. So that's another challenge. Uh, we can have a plan one day and then the day after the whole plan fails, uh, cannot be implemented because the, the, the restrictions are changing. So that's another challenge to take into account. Um, Paul also mentioned the, the issue of uh, having clearance activities that are now basically uh, suspended in, in most contexts. And this has also impact on our EORE activities because the link, with, uh, the link between risk education and clearance cannot uh, happen uh, anymore if, if clearance activities are on standstill or are suspended. So that was another good point. We had a uh, a uh, very good example from, um, from GICHD on um, useful um, technologies uh, that can be used. So thanks again for this uh, overview. Um, I already mentioned the ICRC perspective. I think uh, I will stop here in terms of trying to summarize um, the, the takeaways. Uh, there were many questions raised uh, like how we can coordinate with the health sector. Uh, what are the recommendations for us to safely, to safely uh, deliver? Uh, how, what are the basic recommendations? We have not shared that yet uh, through the uh, risk education uh, working group, for example. So this is something that is needed. Uh, funding was also raised in the chat box, chat box, how we communicate with the donors on this. So many questions have not been addressed during this webinar, but we will do that uh, in the coming days and uh, share with you the Q&A uh, with the A, with the answers that we'll, we'll um, build together uh, and, and share with, with all of you. I also should add that uh, there is an ongoing discussion in the International MRE Working Group uh, on this, it's an, e it's an email discussion. Feel free to participate. We already have a very good thread of discussion uh, so that allows us to dive into uh, examples of, of what works and what doesn't work and, and all the challenges that you are facing. Many of you are not part of the working group yet. So we'll also provide guidance on how to join the group. It's actually very simple, very straightforward. And uh, you can also send me an email if you want to join this group and, and participate in this discussion. Um, I will also would like to emphasize that we don't know yet, uh, I mentioned that the, uh, in the intro, uh, we don't know yet what, uh, how the guidance will take shape. 
uh, but there will be some guidance and we'll work on that with uh, the 15 organizations that are members of the advisory group. So we'll keep you informed on all of these. Um, and I have um, as well one more point. It's April 4, uh, it's forthcoming, it's, it's, it's this week. Uh, this is our international day for mine action, for mine awareness, uh, for mine risk education or EORE and basically my action. So this is, this is happening now. I know that in Syria, in Ukraine, um, in Myanmar, in so many countries, uh, most of the April 4 messaging will focus on COVID. Uh, they, this is a huge crisis. Um, hundreds, possibly hundreds of thousands of people will uh, die from this um, virus. So we can, um, uh, contribute from our side, from our sector. Uh, we are known to be a risk education specialist, so we can also contribute, including for these uh, April 4 uh, celebrations. Um, I would like just to check if with Caitlin, uh, before we, we close this webinar, I would like to check with Caitlin if I don't uh, forget anything or from any um, any panelist uh, who would like to uh, jump in? Do, did I forget uh, anything? Please, panelist, go ahead. Or oh, Caitlin. All good from my side. We have a few people asking when the guidance will be available. Um, I don't know, Uk, if you have an idea on that one. But other than that, all good. I think we cannot give a date. Thanks, Caitlin, for that. We cannot give a date uh, now. Uh, but I can uh, confirm that this is on, on uh, our top priority uh, and we'll raise this among the, um, the EO RE uh, members. Uh, so no, no date so far, but um, as soon as possible. And probably um, my, I think my take on this is that we would provide very short guidance very practical guidance. Uh, it won't be necessarily comprehensive, but there will be some links to other type of guidance that have been displayed by other sectors uh, from the protection side. Um, the, I did, we didn't mention the role of the AOR, the Mine Action AOR, but they uh, uh, already today uh, shared very good guidance from the Global Protection Cluster. So we can um, share as well uh, those guidance from other sectors. And as well, I think the Q&A that, uh, that we are now building uh, will be an annex to this guidance. But we need buy-in and we need agreement from all, all um, uh, members. And I know it, this will happen quickly and, uh, because it's on top of our all priorities. And we have uh, high pressure on our shoulder and a lot of appetite uh, to address this. So it, it, will, be, it will be coming soon. Uh, any other last final point from any speaker and also my co-chair from the advisory group, uh, Sebastian, any last point? No, oh, good. I found it really interesting. I see some positive feedback already on the chat box and good sign everyone was uh, staying on the call. So this was our first experience and I think it worked very well. And thanks to Caitlin also for really managing this well. And I think we'll be together soon. Many thanks, uh, Sebastian, for this um, a very brief conclusion uh, from your side. Any other intervention from any panelists? Yeah, this is Sylvie from JCHD. Again, I would like uh, to thank all of you uh, and please uh, stay safe uh, as much as possible um, and keep safe people who are working for and with. And uh, also just as a reminder, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with me uh, by email uh, and I will be very happy to provide more details on the uh, abstract that have been presented today because those are just abstracts. So I can also share with you some limitations, um, some other uh, good practices and lessons learned that have been shared by uh, people who have been uh, contributing to the survey online and also a massive and huge uh, thanks to all of them uh, who have been contributing so far. You're really helping the sector and your uh, contributions are extremely valuable. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, um, Sylvie, for that. Um, I don't see any other speaker, but please go ahead if you want. Uh, don't hesitate to jump in. Okay, I don't see any other um, um, points. So I just want to apologize for all of you uh, who wanted to speak um, or to raise your hand during this webinar. We had more than 127 participants at some point, so that was quite challenging to give the floor to, to all of those who wanted to, to jump in. But we'll improve this in the next uh, webinar to make these uh, webinars as participatory as possible. And as I said, we'll address each single uh, question, each single point that has been um, raised. So um, all of you, um, please uh, stay safe, um, stay sane in, in this uh, particular time. Um, and uh, we will keep you informed for the, for the next steps, I would like to share my special thanks to our um, um, logistic lead, uh, Caitlin, who helped us um, manage the, 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 whole, um, the whole webinar. So thanks a, a lot, Caitlin, for your support on that. And thanks all of you for your great participation. We stay in touch. Uh, all the best. This meeting, this webinar, this first webinar is now is over. All the best. Have a very nice evening, night uh, or day. All the best.